Please welcome New Jersey Health Commissioner, Dr. Caitlin Baskin. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings to join us this, this evening. I'm Dr. Caitlin Baston. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Health for the state of New Jersey. And as many of you might know, I'm a family physician and I'm also an addiction physician. And I am joined by a pediatrician and also the president and CEO of Neighbor Healthcare, and I wanted to introduce or let her introduce herself to you. Dr. Powell, would you say hello to everybody and tell them a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so like she said, I am a pediatrician by training, and I currently am the president of Neighborhood Health, which is a federally qualified health center that services Union County and the surrounding Middlesex and Somerset counties. A health center, I'm proud to say, services anyone, regardless of their insurance or their immigration status. We provide a, a myriad of primary health care services, which include adult medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, dentistry, behavioral health, and podiatry. So if you are in need of a medical home, you can sure come to Neighborhood Health to get that taken care of. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Powell. And I can't tell you how much our communities depend on our FQHCs, and I trained in an FQHC. It's just amazing to be able to know that you can get access to health care when you need it, regardless of anybody's ability to pay. I mean, what a service. I think, you know, as a primary care doctor, but also as commissioner of health, I'm always focused on keeping people healthy, not just treating them when they're sick, though, of course, that's important, too. Um, and I'm so happy to have you here to talk to a to us a little bit and answer folks' questions about how to stay healthy this fall season. You know, there's been a lot coming up around fall respiratory virus season. It's happened year after year since COVID. There's confusion. I think for a lot of people, there's also still some fear, sometimes fear of getting sick, sometimes fear about vaccines and not really having good information. So this is just so valuable. Um, while we wait for some questions to come in, would you mind just opening up a little bit uh, for the audience with what is so important about how to stay healthy or maybe just correcting some of that misinformation that might be floating around out there? Absolutely. Um, vaccines have been a reliable protection for us for decades. And so with this current season, some of the vaccines that are um, around flu season and around this time of year, their imperative is the COVID-19 vaccine, which is the updated version for 2024 and 2025, which is still important. We are past that pandemic stage, but COVID-19 still exists. And it, you know, over time, your immunity, if you've been vaccinated, will start to wane. So it is important to stay updated with your vaccines because there are still hospitalizations that occur. There is still serious illnesses that can occur. And also by being updated with your vaccines will cover your the new strains coming out, it can um, reduce your risk of having long COVID, which is a myriad or a collection of diseases or illnesses that can affect you over time for months and sometimes up to years. So it's important for us to stay vigilant with COVID vaccine, with flu vaccine, because it's all hitting around the same time. So you want to make sure you get your up updated flu vaccine. And also you've heard a lot about RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, which is an oldie, not a goodie, but an oldie. Um, and that is a respiratory illness, which you've previously have heard a lot about that with young babies and infants. It has a lot of um, cough, wheezing, respiratory illness can lead to hospitalizations and um, um, for children and intubations and serious illness. You're also starting to hear about that with older adults and people who are immunocompromised. So there are some steps you can take with RSV for, for protection as well. And so it's important that we, we take care of the vaccines because that's your number one protection. And also to do the regular uh, Ill, respiratory illness protections like hand hygiene, making sure you, you're, you're um, washing your hands, hand sanitizing, and coughing into your arm, all of those things that we've been so good at over the last two or three years, we want to keep that up. 
That's such a good overview. And I'm so glad you brought up the RSV vaccines or the RSV uh, shot because we now have, you know, new a new way to protect babies from something that used to be one of the biggest reasons babies got hospitalized. Um, and I remember in my residency consistently, you know, admitting and taking care of kiddos that had RSV and really tiny babies. So what an amazing protection. And people can even get that for that protection or an immunization when they're pregnant um, and protect their babies when they're born. Is that right? Absolutely. And so the recommendation is um, during pregnancy. So you can get the RSV vaccine if you get the vaccine when you're pregnant, then it can protect your baby after birth. So it's important that a lot of times when we are asking you as a pregnant woman to get vaccinated is to protect yourself. And also you're passing that protection on to your newborn because when they're born, they are um, are not in an age where they can get vaccinated. So that protection, then you, you, you transfer onto your children. So they have um, for RSV, it's different. You know, you might use the term vaccine, but really it's an antibody that you, you um, get to protect for RSV. So there's one for pregnant women, there is one that has been out for several years, which is um, for synergists for newborns who are high risk. And there is a newer RSV um, antibody that you can um, be given. And the great thing about that one is it protects up to five months with just one administration. And that's for babies that are less than eight months of age. And so that is wonderful because with synergist, you would give uh, have to get an administration once a month. And that still is used for high risk um, babies. But this opens up that protection to a wider um, group of children or or newborns. That's thank you for walking us through that. Um, That was wonderful. And and it's just such a great advancement in science. Um, We have one question um, that I think is a wonderful one and that comes up a lot. Um, It says, when should sick children stay home? This is a toughie, right, for parents, especially as they've gone back to school and, and especially for folks that may have to, like, make plans or changes in their work schedules or anything to keep kiddos home. When should we keep sick kids home? So I think one of the bigger indicators is fever. So if your child has a temperature of more than 104 then you should keep your child home. That is a very, that's an indicator of your immune system that is fighting off something. We don't know what that is, but that is also at the time when you are, have a fever that you can be contagious and also is when your child is feeling icky. So if your child, regardless of what the cause is, is, you know, constant cough, not feeling well, if they're vomiting or having diarrhea or if they're having a fever, they for sure should be kept home from school for themselves and also to reduce the spread to other children and staff as well. <clears throat> and the, the key with that is to keep that, you know, so we, we have the conversation of when to keep them home. And then the next question will always be, well, when is it safe for them to go back? So the general rule is if they have a fever, you want them to be fever free for 24 hours without the use of medication. Right. So, you know, not if if you give them a dose of Motrin and as soon as it goes away, their temperature comes back, then they are still considered what we call febrile. They should still be home. So 24 hours without the need of having any medication to keep their fever down is a big indicator. If they're coughing or having diarrhea, again, you want to keep them home if the, if it's a harsh cough, they're really not feeling well until the symptoms start to die down a little bit, then they can go back to school. But not when they are having a lot of constant coughing, because you know your child is still, again, going to feel miserable at school and also is going to spread to other children. Again, with diarrhea, you want to keep them home for when they, you know, have no episodes for 24 hours. These are all the good indicators now for when you can clear to bring your child back regardless of cause. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thanks for for the other part of that of that answer as well. That's such a critical thing that parents bring up a lot at the doctor's office. Um, we have a couple other really good questions that, that, that came in, some of them um, that came in in advance. This one says, during the pandemic, we fell behind on some of the other childhood immunizations. Is it too late to catch up? And if not, what's the best way to do that? What a great question. That's an excellent question. It is never, ever, 
ever too late for you to get caught up on your vaccines. So the CDC has a actually an approved catch up schedule. Then it's and it's based on the age of your child, what vaccines are needed. Then you would have a you know go to your 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 primary care provider. You sit down with what vaccines that you already have, and the provider will then take that with, along with the age of your child, and look at how you fall into that catch up schedule. And based on that, it will set up a schedule with you to start catching up on your vaccines. So at no point is it too late for you to get your children up to date with their vaccines. So just work with your primary care provider and they will absolutely be able to put you through a safe and approved catch catch up schedule for vaccinations. I'm so glad we went over that because I'm sure that parent is not alone. You know, so many folks didn't didn't go into the office at regular scheduled visits or they a lot of offices were playing catch up after that. And so um, so this is a really common scenario for families. And it's so important. You know, we've seen, I'll just speak from like the health perspective, the commissioner of health perspective for a minute. We've seen a real rise in pertussis this year. <clears throat> off. Um, we've seen a couple cases in the past year of measles and mumps, things that we really had pretty much eradicated through vaccination. You know, we'd see occasional cases, but we don't see those things very often in a vaccinated population. And they've just started to make a surge back as people fell behind or we weren't getting um, people vaccinated. And so it's just a really nice reminder that diseases that we don't want to have to live through again, you know, that uh, as a society, we've just done such a good job of keeping our kids safe as a whole because of all of the advancements of science, you know. And earlier today, I was at our state laboratory and heard some just beautiful stories from our staff and from parents. Um, just about what they, you know, have been able to do through advancements of science for their kids. And it's just a reminder that sometimes it's about going back to the basics, right? And this and these things that we know keep keep kids safe. So thanks for asking that question again. Um, I have another one that's really good that says, how do I know if my child is eligible for the latest COVID-19 shot? Um, how can families kind of take a look and know who should be getting the new the new vaccine this year? The answer is everyone more greater than six months of age should be getting the new 2024 2025 covid vaccine and that is that is if you've been vaccinated or not before for covid so and based on your age based on the type of vaccine you may have or have not or the vaccine that you're going to choose will will we'll let you know whether you have to get one or more than one of those vaccines so it really the, the the long and short of it is that the new tw- what makes it the uh, what we call an updated 2024 or 2025 vaccine is that it's taken into account new strains that are affecting the community at this time. Right. So it's really falling into the pattern of what we've done with the flu vaccine, the influenza vaccine for decades. And the way we we utilize that vaccine is we take, you know, the scientists take a look and see what strains are in the community. And based on those strains, they um, craft the influenza or flu vaccine for that season. We are moving into that um, what we call not a booster. It's an update. Right. And you're going to hear, I think people interchange that a lot, and it's confusing. What's the difference? A booster means you're getting the same vaccine for the same strains more than once. So you're getting it over and over, and it boosts your immunity. An update is giving you something that's covering an additional strain that it wasn't covering before. So we're moving from boosters, which we had at the height of the pandemic, to having updates which is how we do the flu vaccine and now how we do the COVID-19 um, vaccine. So everyone greater than six months, please make an arrangement to get the, the updated vaccine. And as long as it's been two months from the last time you've had a COVID vaccine, then you are are um, able to get the new one. So two months for COVID and people will then have this next question would be, well, what if I have COVID? How long should I wait to get the vaccine, right? And the general gist of it is you can wait up until three months is the recommendation. You really don't need to wait that long. So if it's if you have somebody that's immunocompromised um, in the house, we would recommend you get it as long as you're not um, contagious, that you go in and get that vaccine right away. But you can push it off up to three months after a COVID-19 illness. 
Thanks, Dr. Powell. That was so great to go over. I get that question a lot as a health as well. You know, when is it too soon? Can I get another one? Can I get the update? And why do I need the update? I think what you just talked about with the strains is so important because we are looking at the new strains coming out, right? And viruses change over time and that's what we're covering. So you'll be covered for new strains of the virus um, and keep people from getting sicker, keep people, like you said, reduce your risk of getting long COVID. Um, and still, I think I've heard a lot of people ask me too, well, if I've had COVID, do I need the vaccine? Which I think you covered really nicely. That comes up a lot. And if you've had COVID, having the vaccine still protects you better from hospitalization and severe illness than having had the illness because people can get it multiple times and you can get new strains. But if you've had the vaccine, you have greater protection. Um, even Absolutely. That's great. Um, here's another one that says, um, any symptoms? What symptoms should I watch out for during this season? And are there any symptoms for the current strain of COVID that are different? Question, because I know historically we when we were having new strains, it seemed to seem like a new symptom was associated with it. Um, so pretty much with the current strain, it's the same types of um, symptoms. So there's cough, there's fever, there's body aches, there is sore throat. There is, um, can, you can have GI symptoms. You can still have the, um, the, the no to- lack of taste and smell can be a problem with headaches. Those are the same symptoms generally that we've been having. And that's the same symptoms that you'll see with the new current strain as well. That's great. Thank you so much for going over that. Um, and just in general, I think the CDC has done some really nice work simplifying things for families because it was, you know, COVID and flu and and all these different things you were trying to track all these symptoms. And I think a really nice, clear message and that really goes along with that family's question too, is like, here are the general symptoms of respiratory virus season. And just like you said, Dr. Powell, if your kiddo has a fever, right, that's a good time to stay home. And if you're, and if you or a family member has some of these symptoms, it's a good idea to test for COVID-19 just to have an idea of whether it is COVID-19 and protect your community members um, and make informed decisions. But hopefully we'll get all families protected for COVID and influenza this year with vaccinations. And then, you know, if you do get sick, like we said, nothing fully prevents you from getting sick. Sometimes you can still get sick, but you'll be less likely to have anything severe, way less likely to go to the hospital, less likely to have long COVID. So very much worth it, um, especially yes. if we're going through and getting before we know it will be a <clears throat> holiday season for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, here's another one that says, you know, how do I keep my kids uh, safe when they're playing sports or they're doing other group activities? Anything that we should be um, doing or talking about to keep kids safer or from getting COVID or other infections? Not to sound like a COVID, uh, a, a broken record, but vaccination, 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 you know, right? So vaccinating your child is one of the best ways, whether they're you're playing sports and the activities and attending school is the best way to keep them um, covered. Also, again, the same th- things that we've been talking about, frequent hand washing, make sure you, you talk to your children. Please don't have them share their drinks and share and eat off of each other's spoons and forks and things that they like to do. Some children like to take the gum out of their mouth and give it to their friend. Any of those things that are sharing body fluids, you know, so you want to make sure you talk to your child about that. Frequent hand washing. And if there's no access to water, then make sure you have some hand sanitizer. And if you are coughing or if you know that there's exposure, then a mask is also a part of your toolkit that you want to continue to use for protection, whether you're going to sports or whether you're going to school. That's really helpful. And I think that (laughs) dovetails nicely into this other question that says um, this is a parent that says I have a newborn at home. Um, as well as kids already in school. How do I keep the baby safe from RSV and flu and COVID since they can be exposed to the kids who go to school? So a two-pronged approach, and I think we touched on it a little bit early or earlier. So as a mom of a newborn, getting yourself vaccinated because you're the one that's the closest to the baby, um, you know, and the one that can 
you know, expose your baby more than anyone else. So make sure you are updated with your flu. Make sure you get updated with your COVID vaccine. So that helps give protection. If you didn't get a chance to get it during the end of your pregnancy to pass that immunity on to the baby, you still should get it to protect you. So it reduces your chance of getting that illness and exposing your child. The other children that are in school should be vaccinated as well. So it reduces their risk if they're to be exposed to any for flu or for um, COVID so that they do not come down with the illness or if they do, it won't be severe. So really, when they come home and they're around the baby, again, have them wash their hands, um, hand sanitizer, make sure you're cleaning surfaces at least once a day. And if they're ill, you make sure you keep them separated from the child or from other folks in the family is a good idea. And also teach them how to cough, you know? So you want to make sure your children are not coughing. And it's not just children, unfortunately, but, you know, everybody needs to understand to cough into their elbow. It's into the elbow, not into the hands, not on your sleeve, but in the elbow is where you should be coughing. And then make sure you're sanitizing your hands or washing your hands after that episodes of cough. That's a great, great advice. You know, we talk, we used to teach our kids like into the bat wing, you know, whatever, it, yes. whatever you can say to get the kids to remember. Um, but I, I think you're right. Adults need that. <laughs> we need that too. And what a good message, I think, especially for parents, you know, and as a mom, I can relate to this. It can be so hard to take a minute to take care of yourself when you're taking care of other people. But what what an important thing to do, especially in the fall virus virus season, but anytime, right? Go go taking care of yourself, getting your own vaccines, you know, taking a minute to see your provider and keeping yourself healthy also has ripple effects for the family and can keep everybody else healthy too. So if you're motivated by keeping your kids healthy, it's a good motivator. Um, but it's also just so important uh, that we a that family we- affair, right? It's a family affair. Do it as a group. Do it <laughs> and as just a- so you know. Um, Getting the flu, you can get the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine together. It is safe. So you can get them both at the same time. So you don't need to go back to the, to the doctor two different times. They've been researched and proven safe for you to get them both at the same time. That's great. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions I get about. Can I get, can I really get them? Are they as effective? What happens? You know, can we really get them at the same time? There's a lot of misinformation around that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, another family member asked, um, they said, my child has asthma and is immunocompromised. What else can I do to protect them? Um, good question. Excellent question. And more than anyone, they um, getting them vaccinated as well. Right. So there can be an additional vaccine that your child will get because they're um, immunocompromised. So when you look at the schedule of recommendation, they may say to give an extra dose. And you can talk over that with your provider who will know your child's illness um, the best and will be able to discuss with you what the best plan of attack for that is um, concerned. And just like everything else, if you know that there is someone that is ill, you want to make sure you mask your child. You want to make sure you talk to them about distancing. You want to keep them home if they're ill, but you with the, them being immunocompromised, again, vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. So, you know, a lot of fear, the thought would be, well, if they're immunocompromised and they have an illness, it must be riskier for to give them a vaccine. And, and it's quite the opposite is true. The vaccine's there to boost the immune system. So It's basically there to help your child fight. If their immune system is already compromised, then a vaccine will help and assist them to fight the illnesses that are there. So that is the best time to then get them vaccinated. And it's been studied in children and adults who have had immuno, um, that are immunocompromised. So they specifically have looked at the safety of getting those vaccines when you're immunocompromised. So have that discussion with your provider and they'll you they'll be the best person to guide you on what to do. That's great. Um, we have another question that is talking about um, HEPA filters. And for folks that don't know, there was a, a lot of funding that came out during the COVID pandemic that we supported HEPA filters in schools um, from the Department of Health. It just helped air ventilation, um, which is known to reduce infection. So 
we've had, we had a long standing HEPA filter program. The schools actually had access to those HEPA filters from multiple sources. The Department of Health was one of them. And the majority of schools in our state opted in um, and got HEPA filters and also got replacement filters um, and all of that. We had all those funds um, and that program ran through, ran its course from the Department of Health. Um, but it was a great, it's a great question to bring that up again. And I think a really great thing that we were able to do just thinking about just safety in general and all infections, right? We did this during COVID, but it really does help air quality in general. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that we were thinking about forest fires and other things that can also affect air quality. So um, lots of, of cross benefit from the HEPA filter program. So great question. Just taking a look to see if other questions are coming in. And air ventilation, while she, she is taking a look, air ventilation in, in, in just in general also helps with this. So cracking that window, getting some fresh air coming into your house, that is a great idea, especially if someone is ill in your home. You want to make sure that you get some fresh air that's going into the house. That those reduces the ability for that virus to um, spread in the household. That's great. I don't see any other questions coming in right now. Um, just, you know, top of mind, just thinking about families and staying healthy this fall and kids going back to school. Um, just want to thank you again for all the information that you've provided and so many of the questions that we have. Some of them are just about general vaccinations. You know, as a reminder, I know we talked about everybody getting the annual flu shot, everybody getting the annual COVID shot staying up to date on other vaccinations if you have fallen behind because that can keep you healthy as a whole. Um, some of the families said, what other vaccinations, you know, should I, what are all the vaccinations that I should be thinking about to get my kid um, this fall? Dr. Powell, do you want to just talk about that kind of broad, broad based? Broad based, there is the traditional immunization schedule, right? So you have your MMR, you have the pertussis, you have your tetanus boosters, um, you have um, um, your, um, influenza, the hep. Have B vaccine. There's a host of other vaccines. Varicella for for chickenpox. Um, so there, that whole original immunization schedule is still important and imperative for you to get your child covered for those vaccines. And so you really, it's the you know you can talk to and if you go to the CDC, that'll show you um, a copy of all of the vaccines that a, a child should have based on their age. And I'm sure you are already starting to get them vaccinated, or you've had them already. But they, um, the your pediatrician or your primary care provider will be a good source to you know review what is missing, if anything, what you're due for. Um, and so that's a great place to go as a source of information as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have one other question that says, my child turns 12 in November and my doc recommended Novavax as she reacted to an mRNA vaccine. But the current updated Novavax expires in October. Um, will there be more availability? I think this is also just a nice uh, moment to talk about expirations or um, or when there are notices that come out. I get a lot of questions that say, hey, these vaccines are no longer valid. Don't get them. And just as a reminder, that's because, as Dr. Powell explained a little bit earlier, we get new vaccines. They're not boosters. They're new vaccines every year that really are responding to the new variants. It doesn't mean something was wrong with the old vaccines when they stop or say that they, you know, are expire or they're no longer being used. And sometimes they'll even put a message saying, you know, please destroy or get rid of old vaccines and use the new ones. That's mm -hmm. because they want you to get the most updated, not because something was wrong with the old vaccine. So I did just want to um, point that out. And then I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Powell, to talk about um, new updated vaccine availability this year. Absolutely. And so, yes. And so you, you are absolutely right. The expiration, expir expirations is again, has, you know, every medication has an expiration date. So there's, there's that as well. So even if it's the current or the right vaccine, 
everyone has an expiration date. So you just would basically go to your primary care provider, find out when they would get more of that vaccine in and make sure it's the current updated 2024, 2025 vaccines. So that is, as long as you are asking for that, then you, the provider will make sure that you're getting a non-expired vaccine. That's just basically there's a suggested date that you have to utilize that vaccine before it expires. So there's, there's, it's either expiring because all medications have an expiration date or it's being changed out because there is a new version of that vaccine. So basically working with your provider on getting the most current updated vaccine and make sure it's the, you know, and they will make sure that you are getting a non-expired vaccine is, um, Imperative. So currently there are three COVID-19 vaccines. There's Pfizer, which we've in, and Moderna, which are our microsomal RNA vaccines. That's the new technology. Um, and then there's Nov- Novavax. And what the difference is, Novavax is more your traditional um, vaccine science. And so you, you, that's what you're normally used to with your current vaccines and childhood vaccines, where you um, are putting a protein into the body and it, and it elicits the body to um, make an immune response. That is an, the older technology of vaccines. That is what Nova, Novavax um, does. So that's the difference that groups them out between. But they're all safe. They've all been um, approved for use not just in the United States, but New Jersey as well. The only difference with Novavax as well is that it's for children 12 years of age and up. For Pfizer and Moderna, that could be used for six months and above. And that's the other difference. So work with your provider to see what's best for you. Yeah, that's great general information. And I think, you know, for your question, Novavax does have um, a vaccine for this updated year. And so you'll just have to ask your provider to make sure they're carrying that vaccine if you um, if somebody had a reaction to the mRNA formulations in the past. Um, so really, really excellent questions. Um, in general, um, we were just talking about, you know, what what immunizations folks should get. Um, also talking about somebody else asked, can I choose what formulation I get? So that goes right, right along with uh, that question that we just had. So can you choose? Um, absolutely. If you have an indication for a certain versus another, you just have to ask your provider about what they're carrying. Dr. Powell, anything to add to that? Absolutely. The, the, re- the preference and the recommendation is to stick with the manufacturer you started with. Right. So if there's there's no barriers and have nothing that, you know, that that's keeping you from doing that, it's always best if you started with Pfizer, stay with Pfizer, started with Moderna, you stay with Moderna. But if you are for some reason, like the, the previous question said, you had a reaction to the microsomal RNA or if that that vaccine uh, manufacturer is not available at that uh, for you to get it, then you also can switch to another um, manufacturer, which is safe. So, of course, there is recommendations and there's a schedule based on whether you're staying in the same manufacturer or whether you're switching to another. But you, it's good to do both, but it's preferred that you stay with the same manufacturer if you can. That's great overview. Um, somebody else asked uh, that isn't the pandemic over? You know, why do we have to keep getting vaccinations? And I think it's such a good question because I hear it a lot too, or people will even say in our post pandemic world, um, you know, we're, well, we're post pandemic. And I think you opened a little bit of information with this, Dr. Powell, when you said, you know, COVID's still around. We say now it's endemic, right? It's, it's yes. just here to stay like the flu. We, every year we think about the flu, it's flu season. Every year we think about COVID. Um, but their question is really like, is it over or why do I need to keep getting vaccines? You want to just talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. It's still a significant um, illness that's there. Right. So it's not to the level, which is why you move from these terms of pandemic when we were shutting down and all of those things. We're now in an endemic and the endemic is just that it's kind of going to be one of the, the players. Right. Like the flu. And over time, you will lose immunity or have a what they call a waning immunity. So it's always best to get a, another vaccine to increase your protection against COVID. Because again, there's a risk, 
right? So if you get COVID, there's a risk that you can get long COVID and you want to avoid that. You want to avoid being hospitalized or having severe illness. You want to avoid spreading it to younger children or babies that can't get vaccinated. So there's still a role and they will always be a role at this point for the COVID vaccine. This is the same thing when we had H1N1. Remember that was that came out, that was a big um, uh, virus that came out. And now it is part of the, you know, uh, uh, one of the strains in your flu vaccine, H1N1, is covered there. So there are seasons where the, the increase, there's increase in cases. So that's why you want to continue to be vigilant and continue to get vaccinated because it's still a risk. And I think one of the things I didn't, we didn't talk about, but I wanted to just touch upon because a lot of people have a fear of myocarditis and pericarditis with the vaccines, right? So this is another thing that people have been talk, you know, talking about um, with the vaccines. So, you know, through research, look, we've had some time, we've lived with these vaccines for a while, so we've been able to put these things into perspective. Is there a risk if you take these vaccines? There is a very, very small, small, minute risk for pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart in my uh, the the like outer part of the heart and myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the actual muscles of the heart, there is a risk when you take these vaccines that you can get either, but there is a higher risk if you just get COVID. So the risk for myocarditis and pericarditis is higher if you're not vaccinated than if you take the vaccine. So you always want to weigh the benefits and risks. And because it's such a minute risk with the vaccine, it is still recommended that you get the vaccine. Um, And so I just wanted to make sure we touched upon that because a lot of those questions with athletes um, and myocarditis and pericarditis and young men, which is the, the, the group that tends to have the highest risk for myocarditis and pericarditis, that's that's another fear that people keep people getting the COVID vaccine right now. But I would be more afraid of getting COVID in, in that aspect than getting vaccinated against it. I love that you brought that up. I, we talk about risks and benefits in medicine a lot, right? As primary care providers, a lot of it is risks and benefits. And sometimes people only hear the risks of getting it, but you have to compare it to the risks of not getting it and what happens if you get that infection, which are often higher. Um, I have a lot of those same conversations with my patients where it's actually so much more dangerous to have COVID unvaccinated than your risk is if you get this uh, vaccine. So that's a really nice overview and really lovely and transparent that we talk about, you know, it's not that these aren't here. It's just that they're very small and that the risks are actually higher if you don't get the vaccine than if you get the vaccine. Um, So that's that risk benefit conversation. That's really good. Um, we had one other parent ask a question or a follow up or on the HEPA filters, which I really appreciate. Um, I think this parent is is basically saying, hey, can we make sure or do everything we can from a Department of Health perspective to urge schools to use the HEPA filters they have um, and to make sure that they're doing what they can with them? So I think that's just a great suggestion. And, uh, you know, I have a good relationship with the commissioner of the Department of Education and always happy to put messaging out there and communicate with schools. And as always, too, as parents. Sometimes you're closer to the ground or closer to what's happening in schools, and you're always welcome to reach out to the Department of Health or the Department of Education about things that you're seeing on the ground and, you know, and say, hey, is there anything we can do um, in this particular school? So always happy to have that information. Um, And in general, thank you for being a champion, a parent champion that's talking about those HEPA filters, especially during this season and when they're really critical. Okay. Dr. Powell, anything else as we're kind of winding down questions here? Um, oh, it looks like we might have one more that came in. Um, do you have any t- any tips to help my 10-year-old to understand the importance of s- taking steps to stay healthy? Um, I think this is such an amazing question. Um, there's some more details here, but just to take that kind of top top line question, Unfortunately, I think we talk a lot in healthcare about what to do when you're sick. And we don't talk enough about how to stay healthy. And one of my favorite things is empowering people with information, right? Putting you in the driver's seat, making sure that you and your kids 
feel empowered to, oh, this is what I do to keep my body healthy, or this is what I do to keep myself active or eating well, or all the things that you can do to stay healthy. And, um, and this is, this is such a great question from this parent. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit and then we'll go into some more detail here. Absolutely. Um, again, I, I love this question because the majority of illnesses and diseases that we have can be prevented with diet and exercise. It's an oldie, we, we say it all the time, but it's so true. So the proper nutrition and getting exercise and getting proper sleep are the big tools that help keep your fuel your body to keep you healthy. There's no shortcuts with that. And so when you're talking to your child, and I, you know, I used to always like to make do this trick with my children as well. If you want to grow and you want to grow and you want to get muscles and you want to get taller and you want to get bigger, then you need to sleep. So with kids, I always tell them as a pediatrician, I always tell my kids, you know, you do your, your growing when you're sleeping. So the hormone that comes out that makes you grow happens when you're sleeping. It's like Santa Claus. So you want to tell them that if you want to grow and you want to be big and strong, you need to get your, your sleeping, um, the proper sleep. And you want to get the proper nutrition in order to feed your body to get it big and strong. So those are the things that I would talk to your child about and lead by example. So you're the person as the parents that are bringing the food in the home. So you want to make sure that you set those boundaries because they're looking at you more than what you're saying. They're looking at what you're doing. So if you're talking to them with a mouthful of chips and soda and saying, you know, you ought to eat better. Your child is not going to take that seriously. Well, that is not what you're doing. Right. So it really is you do control what comes in your home. So when I when I had my three children, I raised them. They're somewhat adults now by age. Um, but I never I didn't bring soda in the house. Right. I didn't even bring juice because juice is mostly sugar. Right. And in nature, sugar goes with fiber. So better to eat the apple than to get apple juice. So I would keep low fat milk and water in the house because I knew they would sneak it someplace else. So if they would get their little bit out there with their friends, but I didn't bring it in the home. So it's important to set that standard in the house and to talk about nutritious eating and exercising. And if you could do it as a family, even better to come up with some exercises that you can do in the house. I know we are all busy. We are running around. There's so many things to do, but if you could take 15, 20, 30 minutes, go for a brisk walk, it doesn't have to be complicated. Go for a bike ride. You know, these are some of the things that you can do that are easy and simple to kind of, you know, teach your children about staying healthy. I love that so much. And that goes back again to taking care of yourself, to take care of kids, you know, for caregivers of all kinds, parents and other caregivers in the in the world we live in. It's so hard, right? Everything mm. is scheduled to the minute. And I think another big thing that we talk about a lot, and again, with that, setting that example, I know in my household too, is screen time, right? And having some time connecting with humans, being physically active, being with each other, um, having that interpersonal connection really makes a difference. And when people are getting it on a screen, it's different. And we see, especially in adolescence these days, um, you know, a lot of anxiety and depression, and really putting some limits on that screen time and that social media. And as, as adults, right, if we can kind of do that same thing and say, all right, we're going to turn, we're going to power down. Um, <laughs> we're going to get our, our rest, all those things that you said for the kids. And I'm thinking, wow, we really have to do a good job of that for ourselves as adults, right? Um, and we talk a lot about the nutrition that you that you talked about too, and we want to taste the rainbow not in the skittles way, but in the <laughs> in the fruits and vegetables way, right? <laughs> more colors. We tell the kids all the time: the more colors we have on the plate from fruits and vegetables, more natural colors, the more vitamins we're getting. So, what a great way to try to do that for ourselves and our kids. Um, there's another question that came in that I think is a two part that are both good. One is talking about um, finding old COVID tests that um, they weren't sure of the expiration dates. Um, and so wondering if those are good. And um, the other part of that is just in general, are at-home tests effective at detecting the current strains? Um, both good questions. And I know, Dr. Powell, you were talking earlier about everything has an expiration date on it. Um, 
in in medicine. Hopefully, you know, we can find that somewhere on a package. Absolutely. I think the the at home tests are very effective and they are a great tool. If you don't know what the expiration date is on that box, then there's usually you can look it up. Um, and you can go on the box, find a company, look it up. They can give you the expiration date um, on the box, you know, or for that particular test. But, yes, they are um, helpful. And it's part of a tool. Right. So is there false negatives? Can there be false positives? When they, and the, and to, to just to define what that means. So a false negative means your test is negative, but you actually have the illness. And a false positive is you're positive, but you don't have the illness. And when we create tests, we always um, look and research both false positives and false negatives. However, used properly and in conjunction with everything else, like how are you feeling? So if you are, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So if you're feeling like you got COVID and, and, and you are having a fever, you're achy, and maybe it's not COVID, but you for sure have some viral illness that you're going to follow the same recommendations for anyway. So I wouldn't change what I would do based on if that test is negative or positive. It's just an added little piece of information. But the recommendations are the same regardless of the cause of your fever, of your cough, of diarrhea, of vomiting. It's going to be the same recommendations that we are going to take at this as far as any guidelines that we have. So use it as a tool. Right. And I would I would use um, that would be my best answer for that. I think that's great. And um, that very much aligns with the CDC trying to simplify everything and saying, just think about these as respiratory viruses. It doesn't mean don't test for COVID. It's still a good tool. Um, and just like you said, Dr. Powell, if you find a lot number on that test, if you can find like, a you know, somewhere that says a lot number, usually you can look up that expiration date. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Any kind of last minute words of wisdom, Dr. Powell, that we want to share with families? Um, I think of, I think a big questions that we didn't talk about was um, what are the guidelines, right? And I, I won't go into specifics because every school district is going to have their own specific guidelines. So please, please, please do not say Dr. Powell said, and I'm, you're coming to school with your child anyway, right? But I wanted to just talk about the general trend of what the guidelines say now, because we are coming from the pandemic when you're COVID positive, you're home for 10 days strict, you're not going back till you're negative. Those new guidelines are changing. And so it's changing for school as well. So it's going to it's going to go again, along with how fevers and flu it's based on even if you're COVID positive, if you're 24 hours free of fever. And if your symptoms are improved, then you can go back, but you need to then have a, like a, a elevated precautions that you take. I would send your child back with a mask. You may have your child wear a mask for those next five days. Make sure that they're not getting in the, the every other children or the teacher's faces, right? So you want to keep some distance. If you know you're positive for COVID, you want to tell your children, you can go back to school. You got to have a mask on. Make sure you're washing your hands frequently and make sure you're not going too close to other children. So that's where we're moving with the new recommendations. Not so rigid, really based on symptoms and then based on the specific guidelines that your school system sets for you. And so that is something they will go over with you. But I just wanted to touch base on that conversation because I know that's going to be something that's um, well, people, it's very confusing as to where we used to be and where we are now. Thank you for going over that. That's amazing. And there's some really good graphics from the CDC um, that we put out as the Department of Health to help clarify that for families. And and as as you said, always, you know, look at your school's guidelines and follow what they say. But it's just really good general guidance. Um, thank you so much for going over that and for all the information. And I just want to say, Thanks to all the families who came on tonight. I mean, I know in our busy, busy lives that it is so hard to take time out of our days. And I just so appreciate how engaged folks have been on their health. You know, I think there really is a great movement of empowerment and engagement in this space. And people want to know more and they want to keep themselves and their families healthy. 
And what an amazing movement for us as a society to really focus on that and focus on on primary care and going to see your doctor and listening to to your providers. And we got this amazing privilege tonight of getting to have our own private, you know, pediatrician and president and CEO, Dr. Carrie Powell, with us tonight. Um, so thank you for being that doctor consultant to all of us and to all the families in New Jersey tonight, Dr. Powell. That was just wonderful. Thank um, you for having me. It was this was great. Pleasure. And for those who want more information, just so you know, um, you can always get information at our Department of Health website. Um, we have a lot of information out there for families that in general. Um, so that's nj.gov slash health. And then we have a particular vaccine page. So you can always go to nj.gov slash health slash vaccines or in Espanol, nj.gov barra health barra vacunas. So please feel free to uh, visit either one of those. Check out the information we have that's validated, vetted, true information on there for all of you. Um, and if you want to see things that aren't there, let us know because our job is to empower you. Thanks again. Thanks everyone and, and, for your time. If, and, and I just wanted to just add yeah. one more thing. If you yeah. need a primary care home, there is a federally qualified health center in every county in the state. You can go to njpca.org to find the a closest federally qualified health center near you. And specifically for my health center, it's www.nhscnj.org. So we, if you don't have a home or you, you need some services, please, please visit those sites so that we can take care of you. Thank you for saying that, Dr. Powell. <clears throat> Again, our FQHCs are such cornerstones of health and primary care in our communities um, and integrated care, which is the model that we're moving toward for the state. Um, it is the model we should be using. So thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone, for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful night and stay healthy, New Jersey.